the gleaming ball in the sky that we call the sun holds many secrets in its core. Secrets that have powered the solar system for millions of years and given life to everything on planet Earth. If we could learn the secrets of the mighty sun, if we could gain access to even a fraction of its unique chemistry, we might unlock the key to our very own future. Could this dream become a reality? Could we one day recreate the sun right here on Earth? That's a question of science. The sun is the headlining star in our solar system. So powerful is its brilliance that even at 150 million kilometers away, we on Earth can't look directly at it. This ball of white hot light blazes at nearly 6,000 degrees Celsius at its surface, throwing out a whopping 1.7 million degrees Celsius from its corona. At this temperature, the sun is a furnace, emanating enough light and energy to support all life on Earth. It is this furnace that might also hold the key to our future survival. But only if we first learn what makes the sun so hot. Ancient thinkers studied its closest equivalent on Earth, fire. When something burns, like wood or coal, it is usually the result of chemical reactions which release energy. What was happening in the sun that triggered such fiery energy? In 1850, German thinker Hermann von Helmholtz suggested that solar energy was a result of gravitational collapse or a rapid compression of matter due to forces of gravity. The mystery became clearer at the turn of the 20th century when experimentalists got a first glimpse inside the atom. Ernest Rutherford, widely considered the father of nuclear physics, suggested that the sun's energy might come from radioactive decay. This meant that the nuclei of unstable atoms inside the sun were losing matter while releasing large amounts of energy. In 1920, British astrophysicist Sir Arthur Eddington proposed that the sun's core was a blistering hot and high-pressure furnace, where hydrogen nuclei were fusing or joining together to form helium nuclei. These fusion reactions led to an immense production of energy, so immense that it could even reach us here on Earth. By the 1930s, astrophysicists Subramanian Chandrasekhar and Hans Bether had independently and mathematically confirmed this hypothesis. It was now official. The source of the sun's energy was thermonuclear fusion. Back on Earth, scientists began to ask the question, if we could understand how thermonuclear fusion happens in the sun, could we perhaps recreate and control it? And if that dream became a reality, could we solve one of the biggest crises affecting modern life? In the 21st century, human beings are exploding in number. They're putting more pressure on the Earth's resources than ever before, especially on dwindling energy resources like fossil fuels. Consider that the global population is set to rise to nearly 10 billion by 2050 and you'll realize just how much energy is required to ensure our future. Researchers around the world are racing against time to fill this energy need. For one group, the quest is as futuristic as it is ancient. Just as the ancients stared into the fire to decode the sun's energy, this group is studying plasma to understand how controlled thermonuclear fusion could one day become a reality. At IPR, or the Institute for Plasma Research in Gandhinagar, Gujarat, scientists are studying the fascinating fourth state of matter. But what exactly is plasma? 
most of us are familiar with the three states in which matter can exist. It can exist as solids, where atoms are packed rigidly together. It can exist as liquids, where the atoms are more loosely packed and freer to move about. It can also exist as gas, where atoms are far freer to move about than in the other two states. It's well known that as we increase temperature or energy, matter moves from the solid to liquid to gaseous state. But what happens if we don't stop there? At extremely high temperatures, atomic particles within gases begin to break their constraints and ionize. Negatively charged particles distance themselves from positively charged particles in the nucleus. The charged particles now cohabit in a soup-like state that's neither solid, nor liquid, nor gas, but plasma. Plasma, not to be confused with the colourless fluid called blood plasma, is all around us. Fire, studied by ancients, is a type of plasma, as is the lightning we see on a stormy night. It's the stuff found inside fluorescent lamps, neon signs and TVs. In fact, 99% of the universe is plasma. And it's what the furnace-like sun is comprised of. Most importantly, plasma is the only state in which thermonuclear fusion can take place. This is because at temperatures as high as millions of degrees Celsius, positively charged nuclei gain so much energy that they overcome their mutual repulsion and binding energy. This allows them to fuse together, creating far more energy than was used to fuse them. That's just some of the reasons why scientists at IPR are fascinated by plasma. This fourth state is produced whenever violence is done to matter. The biggest application that it has is, of, of course, thermonuclear fusion. As we know, stars burn brilliantly for billions of years and they are using a source of energy from the nucleus which comes from nuclear fusion. And in order to be able to utilize that source, we have to heat a mixture of gases to a very high temperature so that the matter is in the plasma state. That's what's happening inside the sun, inside all the stars, and we have to produce similar conditions in the laboratory. In the words of French Nobel laureate Pierre Gilles de Jean, we say that we will put the sun into a box. The idea is pretty. The problem is, we don't know how to make the box. Plasma, like the sun's, is like a naughty child with a mind of its own. The biggest challenge for plasma scientists is, how can plasma be created, contained and confined long enough to cause controlled thermonuclear fusion reactions? Since plasma is made up of charged particles, it can be kept in line with the electromagnetic force. At IPR, decades have gone into perfecting how to control plasma using magnetic fields. Just like plastic bottles can confine liquids, magnetic bottles made up of electromagnetic force can discipline plasma. But plasma is nothing like any liquid we know. Fusion happens at 150 million degrees, much higher than tungstens, which has the highest melting point of 3,200 degrees. Obviously, no ordinary bottle will do for plasma. Just like plastic bottles can confine liquids, magnetic bottles made up of electromagnetic force can discipline plasma. This experimental apparatus is called as beta, which stands for basic experiments in toroidal assembly. So the basic purpose is to produce plasma in a toroidal configuration. What exactly is a toroidal configuration of magnetic field? The word toroidal is rooted in torus, which is a donut-shaped formation where lines move in a circular fashion but never intersect. As compared to other magnetic configurations, this is the best kind to keep the unstable plasma alive. Inside the beta machine, toroidal magnetic fields are created by red and yellow electromagnets. A large current is passed, which ionizes the argon gas inside the steel bottle, creating plasma. 
the beta steroidal magnetic fields are ideal for keeping the unpredictable plasma confined in its concentric field lines. But there's a catch. This confinement is not for more than a fraction of a second. So if plasma scientists want to study how thermonuclear fusion occurs, they need bigger and more efficient magnetic bottles. That's exactly what machines called Tokomax are. This is Aditya, India's first indigenously designed and built Tokomac. It produces a maximum magnetic field of 1.5 Tesla generated by 20 toroidal magnets. In a four-second operation in Aditya, plasma forms and lives longer than the beta machine. But still, it's only for 300 milliseconds. Operational since September 1989, Aditya has helped scientists observe many quirks of the fourth state of matter, including how plasma behaves as a collective, how it fluctuates unpredictably and shows turbulent behaviors. One of these behaviors is intermittency, and it was at Aditya that it was first understood. Intermittency explains how, when plasma is confined in a magnetic field, its charged particles tend to break free not individually, but in groups, in intermittent time gaps. If you want to learn about how they come out, and if you, want, if you know how they come out, we can confine them more by knowing that what, by which procedure they are coming. It was found that they don't come regularly out. They come in bunches. So this transport is called intermittency because it is coming in bursts. So this is first observed in uh, and first shown in Aditya Tokomak. It was very useful for future development of Tokomak machines, bigger Tokomak machines. We could uh, discover something called intermittency, which is the way the heat is transported out of the plasma, uh, which was first discovered in Aditya in, uh, in the 90s, which was then later confirmed by other Tokomaks around the globe. The Aditya Tokomak has been going strong for over two decades now, helping us gain more insight into how plasma and thermonuclear fusion might work. It's inspired IPR's technologists to aim even higher and ask, can we build a Tokomak where plasma lasts not just for one, two or four seconds, but a thousand? The answer lies here with the next generation of Indian Tokomaks. This is the SST-1, or Steady State Superconducting Tokomak. As the name suggests, it has the ability to maintain a steady state of plasma for a very long period of time, up to a thousand seconds. So how is it different from the Aditya? Here, as this electromagnets contains current, so they get heated up. So we need to cool them and that's why we put water through them. That water cools the coil. But even with that water cooling, we can't keep them on for very long time. So it is being kept on for only four seconds. In SST, uh, we use superconducting magnets. So the magnets are super cooled by some super cooled liquids. So there is no water cooling. And then we can make this operation continue for very longer time. Superconducting magnets. It's what allows the SST-1 to keep plasma alive without overheating the tokomak. 16 D-shaped magnets use liquid helium to cool to such low temperatures that they allow current to flow with nearly zero resistance. This machine demonstrates as to how very large magnetic fields could be produced with very large superconducting magnets. When we say superconducting magnets, means the magnets can be made superconducting, they can be cooled down to minus 269 degrees centigrade with liquid helium, and they can maintain a magnetic field of the order of something like 51,000 Gauss, which is about 250,000 times of Earth's magnetic field forever. Keeping this large magnetic field alive requires state-of-the-art superconducting cooling. 
what you are seeing behind me is actually the SST1, the steady state superconducting tokamax cryogenic facility, which is used to cool the about 40,000 kilograms of cold mass to minus 269 degree centigrade from room temperature. This is one of its unique and is the largest in the country. The SST1 boasts some of the largest cryogenics in India. The SST1's design makes for an enormous magnetic field that's able to sustain steady plasma for a long period of time. Long enough that scientists can learn about producing thermonuclear fusion energy. So could we perhaps one day dream of a plasma-based thermonuclear fusion reactor, one that could potentially end our power wars? If this global group of scientists, engineers and technologists has anything to do with it, yes. Cadarache, France. All hopes of a fusion-driven future are hinged on a unique mega science collaboration that's being built here. The ITER, or International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, is the largest and first of its kind tokamak reactor built by seven global members, including India. Its aim, to generate 10 times the energy put into it by achieving controlled thermonuclear fusion for the generation of commercial power. What exactly will go on inside the ITER? It's like a mini sun that will produce helium and vast amounts of energy from the plasma fusion of two isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium. These may be reactions happening at the subatomic scale, but they require massive machines to be carried out in. The ITER is a 30 meter by 30 meter reactor as tall as a 10 storied building. It will house the largest magnetic confinement of plasma anywhere in the world, a feat of unprecedented engineering advancement. This is 1 50th of the size of ITER, which is International Tokamak Experimental Reactor. And uh, this is, you can see, roughly about 2 foot. So the whole thing will be about 100 foot, about 30 meters. And, uh, you know, if you want to just look at the plasma, I know this is how, this is the zone where the plasma will be created, okay? And that's the vessel in which houses the plasma. That's the component which produces power. And this power is then radiant on the blankets. You can see the blanket module there. These are the blankets which receive the power. And eventually in a future reactor, these blankets will be like heat exchangers they will then ultimately connect to the turbines. India joins the EU, USA, Russia, China, Japan and South Korea in building the ITER. It's in charge of nine technology and engineering packages with 150 scientists joining the collaboration. India will have a key role in plasma creation as well as technologies that will drive fusion. The most visible contribution of India, which is large, and is the cryostat, which actually houses the heat. France has a regulation which controls the radiation and tells us how much radiation should escape. So ITER has designed a vacuum vessel within which there are special boron containing steel plates. So India's job is to manufacture them. Then there are other systems like heating systems which are not visible here. So these are ports. Some of these ports will have uh, radio frequency heating systems and some will have a neutral beam heating. So that's how the heater plasma will be heated to high temperatures and uh, that's how it will go into a fusion mode. Being part of ITER puts India in the minority of countries that are prepared for a fusion-driven future. You see, the thermonuclear fusion as a goal is very ambitious. As a partner of ITER, we have access to 10% technologies. We also get access to 90% designs of the rest of ITER. So that we get to know what else there is to do. 
if all goes according to plan, ITER could set the stage for the next generation power reactors that bring fusion energy to the commercial market. This energy, experts believe, will not just be sufficient for our needs, but will also be clean with minimal impact on the environment. Scientists also assert that there is no possibility of a catastrophic accident in the reactor as plasma fusion stops as soon as the magnetic field shuts down. But there's a caveat. Achieving viable fusion energy is still a while away. Uh, fusion research is quite complex, I would say. And uh, as uh, of today, uh, fusion is no more a dream. It has become a reality because we have started constructing the ITER project. This probably could be seen by, uh, let's say, 2030 or around that. And once this is uh, achieved, uh, we take a, a big step forward. I would say that in the mid uh, of the second half of, the, of this century, we should be able to uh, harness uh, energy with the help of uh, fusion technology. The realization of fusion energy may be decades away, but it is a pursuit that's fired up the scientists of today. They chase the stormy plasmas, which may hold the secret to securing our future and recreate a piece of the sun right here on Earth. If you'd like to share your feedback on today's program, please send your suggestions and comments to Vigyan Prasar, C24 Kutub Institutional Area, New Delhi 110016. Or you can mail us at info at vigyanprasar.gov.in.